Okay, good morning, folks. Good morning, Good. I feel like we can do a bit better than that. Good, good morning, folks. Good morning, Good. good. So today is Pentecost Sunday. If you don't know what that is, it marks 50 days since Easter. It's all about the Holy Spirit, God's promised comforter and counsellor who is always with us. It's a day of celebration because it means we are never alone. The Spirit lives inside of us because of the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. I'm going to begin today's service by reading from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4, it tells the story of that first Pentecost day. It says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they, that's the disciples, were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That was the beginning of what we know today as the church. From that infilling of the Holy Spirit, the word was preached, people joined the Jesus movement, and for 2,000 years since then, Christians have met together to worship Jesus. It is the birthday of the church, the celebration that we are never alone. Today is a day of joy and excitement. So would you bow your heads as we pray on this great day of celebration in the church calendar. And so Almighty God, your Holy Spirit came to Jesus' disciples hidden in an upper room in Jerusalem. A violent wind and tongues of fire were the symbols of a new and exciting thing that was happening in their lives. We ask that for us here today, may the Holy Spirit burst into our lives, encouraging us and inspiring us to proclaim boldly the good news of Jesus and the healing and the hope that he offers to all nations. So God of power, may the boldness of your Spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your Spirit lead us. And may the gifts of your Spirit be our goal and our source of strength, both now and always. Amen. And we are going to turn to our scripture readings for this Pentecost Sunday. So these are our lectionary readings that I'm sharing with you today. The readings set in a three-year cycle. And it's interesting that when we talk about Pentecost, we often look to that Acts reading about the day that the Holy Spirit descended. But the Spirit, of course, is not just limited to that passage in Acts. The Spirit whom God sends is prophesied about in the Old Testament and mentioned all throughout Scripture. So we're going to unpack a, a bit more of a fuller view of the Spirit today. I'm starting off reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 1 to 14. It's an, uh, a fascinating story of how, through a vision, God teaches the prophet Ezekiel about real hope in the midst of crisis. And so... From verse 1 of Ezekiel 37 we read, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise. A rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath inside them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. 
Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. This morning I'm reading from John 16 and verses 7 to 15. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Father will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is the Gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God for his word. So Pentecost is this big day of celebration. And we kind of do this every year. So it's one of those occasions when... Because we know the story so well, and we've done this many, many times, we can kind of take for granted what it's all about. We know that the Holy Spirit comes to the disciples, that they start speaking in different languages, that it draws people in, and Peter stands up and brings people into the kingdom of God. But I want you today to begin by thinking about where those disciples were on the day of Pentecost. They were in Jerusalem, and they had been told by Jesus to wait. To sit and wait for when the Spirit would come to them. Now that's a hard thing to do. Jesus, their leader, has just left them. Ascended up into heaven and they are on their own. They have no sense of what their future will hold or what it is that they are going to do. They are worried. They are concerned about what it is that they are going to fill their lives with. But more than that, they are living in the same city that killed Jesus not so many weeks ago. There are still those same parties, the Romans and the Jewish religious leaders, who are not so keen on this whole Jesus movement thing. And those disciples, they sit in the upper room in Jerusalem, and they hope, and they wait, and they pray for something to happen. And then on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit arrives, things are never the same again. They are filled with purpose and vision and an idea of what it is they must spend their time doing. They go from being hopeless to hopeful evangelists going all throughout the known world, telling people about Jesus. They are empowered, given real impetus in their lives by the Holy Spirit. And you know what? They do it. They change the course of human history forever. And amazingly, day. Do you know, a couple of hundred years after the day of Pentecost, there was that period in history known as the Dark Ages. So the Dark Ages went from about the 5th century to uh, 1,000 or so, 600 years of real darkness in Western civilization. There was hardly any food. All the people who had knowledge and who had ideas about how to run things had died out and that knowledge was lost. People lived a hard and difficult existence. Many people couldn't read or write. Many people just eked out a living with whatever they could find. And one of the the only real bright sparks 
in their lives would have been the cathedral in the center of the town or the village. See, these cathedrals brought with them jobs for the whole town. Thousands of people would get work, whether it was building the cathedral or painting murals or being involved in making the intricate decorations. And cathedrals were always this thing of beauty and bright color in an otherwise drab and hopeless world. But on the day of Pentecost, a fascinating thing happened in many of these cathedrals. See, these cathedrals were designed to have like little boxes in the ceilings. And so there would be some unlucky parishioners, I know who I would choose in this church, who'd have to climb up into the roof, and at the appropriate time, when the reading of Acts 2 was read, they would open up these doors and release doves to swoop down over the congregation. Talk about making the reading come alive. These people who couldn't read for themselves saw and felt and experienced what Pentecost would have been. Then other people from the roofs would drop down rose petals. The red rose petals would be like the the tongues of fire that uh, arrested or landed on all of the people. A real experience of what the Holy Spirit brings. Hope and vitality in an otherwise hopeless world. Now we don't have any doors in the ceiling today. There's no dove that's going to swoop down on you. There might be a bat every now and then. There's one that comes from up there behind me. But that same sense of excitement, that same sense of experiencing the Spirit, is something that I believe we can have here today. Because you know what? That's what the Spirit has always done. When life is dull and drab, or when we're feeling hopeless and out of touch, it is the Spirit who offers that vitality and that newness. When all you see and experience is problems and decay, that's when we need to be reminded that God has sent His Spirit, and His Spirit is with us. You know, the Holy Spirit has been described in many, many different ways. He's like a a breath of wind that blows away the dust and makes everything clean. He is like refreshing cool water to a parched throat. He's like a cleansing fire that burns away the old growth in the bush so that new life and new growth can start. He's like a potter who starts with an ugly lump and molds and shapes and transforms that into something useful and beautiful. He's like a a renovator who takes what is there and spruces it up and renews it and gives it new purpose and beauty. He's like that gentle tap on the shoulder that makes us realize, hey, that's me. I need to pay attention here. I need to work in this regard. There's something that I need to change in my life. And so that same spirit that changed the lives of those disciples 2,000 years ago is the same spirit that we believe we get to experience today. We started our service with that reading from Acts 2. And it seems like a very loud and uh, exciting and noisy experience. The, The rushing of the wind, the speaking in many different tongues, the vision of fire and flames resting on everyone. And I don't know about you, but when I read that stuff, I feel like that's not like what we do in the Methodist Church. Maybe you feel a little bit different. That sounds a whole lot more like what happens in the churches of our charismatic brothers or Pentecostal sisters. The loud, the, the bright, the big show. And so for a long time I've wrestled with this thing. If we don't have these big wild displays of the Spirit in our church, does that mean that we don't have the Spirit? Does it mean that God loves those other churches that display the Spirit more vividly than us? more than what He loves us? Do we need to be like that to be in line with what God wants? But then I realized that that is a story of the Spirit, in and amongst hundreds of mentions of the Spirit in the Holy Holy Bible. So we realized that the Spirit doesn't come in one way, but in fact the Spirit comes in numerous different ways. It's not about sameness and being like everyone else, it's about connecting with the Spirit when He arrives, when He appears, when we connect ourselves with Him. And so, today, I want to look at some of the lesser-known readings that speak about the Spirit, because I think 
they offer us a wonderful reminder of who the Spirit really is and how we can experience Him and enjoy Him in our lives. Because that's what Pentecost is all about. That the Spirit is here. In fact, He is already in your heart if you believe in Jesus. And you can encounter Him on a daily basis. So our Old Testament reading speaks about this this vision or this prophecy that Isaiah has about this valley of dry bones. It's quite a vivid image. But it's also a sad image. A hopeless image. An image devoid of anything good. A dry valley filled with dry bones. I mean, how long does it take for bones to dry out? This is a vast army that has been dead for a long time. There is no hope of reawakening or of life coming back into the dire and hopeless valley of bones. I love the question that the Lord asks the prophet Ezekiel in uh, chapter 37, verse 3. It says, He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel, as you look to all these dry bones in this valley, as you see how long these people have been dead for, how little hope there is in this dire place. Can you even get your head around the notion that these bones can come back to life? That life can re-enter this desolate place? <coughs> you know what? I think lots of us have some sense of what that valley of dry bones is like, isn't it? Can there be life and hope for me in this situation that I'm going through? Is it even possible for my circumstances to get any better? In the place of death or decay, can you even imagine any life returning? We know these kinds of experiences. It's a terminal diagnosis or an illness that won't go away. It's a situation that no matter how much you've prayed about doesn't get any better. It's that person who you love who will just never seem to change, who never seem to embrace the goodness that God has for them. As South Africans, we look at our country and we think this is the truth for us. Will our municipalities ever be functional? Will our country ever get any better? Will we ever have leaders who lead us well and with purpose and with integrity? We all have our valleys of dry bones. And God's message to us through Ezekiel is that, you know what? There can be life again. No matter how dry those bones seem to be, no matter how hopeless you feel, no matter how devoid of life it may appear to be, things can change. <clears throat> I love the words in Ezekiel of when he prophesies to the valley and the bones start to come together. There's this description that the bones start to rattle. Can you hear that sound in your mind? The bones rattling on the ground as they start finding their partner. And then how the sinew and the tendons start joining. And then the skin covers over the bones and the tendons and the flesh. And then all of a sudden there is this valley filled with bodies that have come back together. But there's no life in them just yet. Ezekiel is then told to prophesy a second time. And this time specifically to prophesy that the breath would come into them. It's a wonderful picture of the Spirit, the breath of God. And he prophesies and this wind blows. So it sounds very similar to our story from Acts chapter 2. And this life enters these bodies. They come back to life. They are filled with vitality. And so that valley that looked desolate and hopeless just a few moments earlier is now a valley containing the strength and the vitality and the hopefulness of a massive army, reinvigorated and reawakened to do the work. And then, God speaks to Ezekiel saying, do you know what? This picture I've given you, this vision that you see, is actually my people of Israel. You see, they feel like they are in a dry and desolate valley. They had been exiled. They had lost their nation and their homes. They were living in a horrible condition. And they thought there was no hope left for them. But Ezekiel is told to prophesy to God's people that I will send my spirit. I will breathe new life into you 
There can be hope again. All is not lost. And for me, that's the joy of Pentecost. That that spirit that Ezekiel prophesied about all those years ago is the spirit that God sent on the day of Pentecost. So for all those hopelessness, uh, and all the hopelessness and the tough experiences that we face, you know, it's too soon to give up on hope. It's too soon to believe that the situation won't change or get any better. Because God and His spirit is in the habit of breathing new life where there seemed to be no, new, uh, no life. So maybe we need to remember on this day of Pentecost that Pentecost is not so much about fire falling on our heads and us speaking in different languages. But maybe it's all about the Spirit of God being with us and equipping us and strengthening us to do what it is that God wants us to do. To remind us that situations can change, that there can be hope again, that it's too soon to give up on God. For me, this is almost... um, Fulfilled in the promise of Jesus from John chapter 16. In, John, in John's Gospel, the Holy Spirit is described in a unique way. It's not described anywhere else in the Bible in this way. It's the Greek word parakletos. We call it the paraclete in English. But it is a fascinating word. It's got multiple meanings. Jesus speaks about how he will send the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. It's described as an advocate or a comforter, or a counsellor. Someone who will come alongside and help. It's a profound promise that Jesus makes. He says in John chapter 14, verse 16, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. That's what is fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God, the comforter, the paraclete coming to us. Now that word parakletos, it's, in the, it's got this passive kind of sense to it. It's not about power and a big bold show of things. It's rather a definition of someone who comes alongside, who functions in a supporting role. Someone who is with you as you face up to all the tough things. A counsellor who encourages you. A comforter who reminds you, you know what, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. Or an advocate to come and give you advice and guidance about what the next step to take is. That's the beautiful picture of the Spirit that Jesus paints for us in John's Gospel. That the Spirit, when He comes, it's not just about loud noises and rushing wind and big flames of fire. It's about God's presence coming alongside us. Coming alongside you to help, to guide to comfort, to reassure, to journey with you through whatever it is that you are facing. And I don't know about you, but I feel like that message is under-portrayed on the day of Pentecost. We forget that that is the real power, that we are never, ever alone. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' closing words to the disciples, according to Matthew, are... And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, verse 20. How is Jesus with us always? In the form of the Spirit, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, who journeys with you, so that you are never apart from God and His power. And that is why we as Christians get to look at the world differently. We don't have to get bogged down by the things that we don't see yet or the situations that haven't been fixed because we are not alone in whatever it is we face up to, in whatever it is we see going on around us. We have the presence of God and His power and His comfort and His guidance with us 24-7 every step we take. And that, my friends, is something worth celebrating. And that's why Pentecost is so important. That's what Pentecost is really about. That's what we celebrate today. And so my prayer for you is that I don't know exactly what it is you are going through, what you are facing. I don't know what you've recently been through. But I know there might be a few situations where it looked like you were in a valley of dry bones. We might feel like you're in a valley of dry bones now. 
What I want you to hear today is that you are not alone in that place of hopelessness. And maybe you are sitting here today and you've got a smile on your face because you've come through that valley. You've experienced the way that God breathed His Spirit into that situation. How He transformed things. How He changed a hopeless situation into something beautiful. We need you. And we need your stories because they are an encouragement to us who are still in the valley. But may you be reminded of the most amazing truth. That the God who flings stars into space by the mention of a few words. The God of all power who holds creation in His hands is the same God who says, I'm coming alongside you. I will be with you in whatever it is you go through. You will not face one situation on your own. And if you listen, if you open up yourself to me, I will guide you, I will show you, I will help you, I will comfort you. And that, my friends, is the greatest joy and peace we can know. Amen. Amen. Folks, maybe let's have a moment of quiet as we consider what it is we might have been hearing God say to us. Maybe there's a a rising sense of thankfulness bubbling up in you as you see how God's Spirit has been a help and a guidance. Maybe there's a situation that you want to just bring before God again in prayer and ask for His Spirit to breathe new life into what you're seeing happen at the moment. Maybe there's someone you know about, a friend, a family member, who really needs to experience God coming alongside them. Maybe we want to use these moments of quiet to pray for them. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit and all that we get to celebrate today on the day of Pentecost. Thank you that we are never alone because your presence is always with us. We ask that we would truly experience and know the way that you come alongside us and support us and help us and guide us. And may your Spirit, Lord, make all the difference in our lives and breathe new life and new hope into the situations that we are facing. Help us to know that wherever we go, we go with you. And may your power and your work be done in our lives. Because that's what we pray for in Jesus' name. Amen.